Hello. The next topic we're going to look at um, is going to be uh, normal intracardiac oxygen saturations. I know this may seem a little bit obvious to you know to people what the normal intracardiac oxygen saturations are, but I think it's very very important to understand what they are in each particular location within the heart and understand what would cause them to be abnormal. <coughs> With this, looking at the varying oxygen saturations will give you a really good idea particularly in patients with abnormal anatomies as to what's going on without having a real clear picture as in without taking them to the operating room you know if the echo is a little bit questionable you know results from the cath lab things like that so we tend to use normal intracardiac or we tend to use intracardiac oxygen saturations to give us a really good idea as to what's shunting where in this particular in this particular topic you're going to see me using this picture a lot <coughs> This is actually one of my favorite pictures when it comes to um, hemodynamics and pediatric cardiac physiology, primarily because it's a blank slate and you can write whatever in you like. Um, before we start, I just want to really, really quickly review just the path of blood flow. I know you guys are very familiar with this by now, but um, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Uh, blood returns to the heart via the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava. Um, all the blood from the superior vena cava and the inferior vena cava accumulates in the right atrium and then travels through the tricuspid valve into the right ventricle. After the blood travels into the right ventricle, the right ventricle will pump and the blood will be pumped through the pulmonary valve into the main pulmonary artery. After the blood is pumped into the main pulmonary artery, it, the main pulmonary artery then bifurcates into the left and right pulmonary arteries. So over here we have the left pulmonary artery. Let's put a little dot right here. Yeah. And over here we have the right pulmonary artery. The blood goes out to the lungs and it does something that's you know very important. <coughs> but for the purposes of our talk today, we're not overly concerned with what it does out in the lungs. You know, it drops off some CO2, picks up some oxygen, and it's whatever. It's, people say it's important. But then the blood comes back to the heart via the four pulmonary veins, one, two, three, four, and you have two pulmonary veins for the left side. So you have the left pulmonary veins here, and you have the right pulmonary veins right here. And then the blood will all accumulate in the left atrium. It will then flow through the mitral valve into the left ventricle and then when the left when the left ventricle contracts the blood will flow through the aortic valve into the aorta now your aorta is separated out normally into three primary parts you have your ascending aorta that goes to about this point you have your aortic arch which goes to about this point <coughs> excuse me and then you have the descending aorta which usually is towards the po or it's not usually it is towards the posterior uh, thoracic space. So you're going to see it behind the heart, and you can actually see the descending aorta continue on down here. So this is the descending. Over here you have the ascending aorta. And just for you know, just for shorthand's sake, traditionally in the in the topics that I talk about, I will write AO for aorta, just so nobody's confused. And this is the aortic arch. Um, a lot of people tend to forget the names of the different innominate arteries. There are three. The first one is the brachiocephalic artery. This this turns into the brachiocephalic artery here, and you have the the left com or the right common carotid artery there. Here you have the left carotid artery, and over here you have the left subclavian artery. So now that we have everything labeled, we can look at the normal intracardiac oxygen saturations. So what most people think about is they look at a venous sat or a SVO2. And they look at an arterial sat, an SAO2. <coughs> and when you ask someone what a normal venous sat is, as a general rule, people will say about 75 
percent. And if you ask someone what a normal arterial oxygen saturation is, a lot of people will say, you know, greater than 95 or greater than 92. Um, some people will say it will give you a range 95 to 100. The range that I tend to use for normal arterial oxygen saturation is anywhere between 95 and 99 percent. And we'll get into exactly why it's not 100 here in just a minute. <coughs> but the real question we should ask if someone is asking us what a normal venous oxygen saturation is, you should be asking them, where are we measuring this? And this is particularly relevant because I see a lot of nurses and they'll, they'll take a venous blood gas from a patient and they'll take it from a peripheral IV when they're putting it in. They'll have a tourniquet on, things like that. And then we'll wonder why the venous oxygen saturation is very, very low. And we'll try to make, we'll try to make assessments about the patient's cardiac output. But you really can't do that. So um, we, when we look at the venous oxygen saturation, we'll primarily, for hemodynamics and pediatric cardiology standpoint, we're going to be looking at the venous, the venous oxygen saturations on the right side of the heart. <coughs> so the blood comes back to the heart via the superior vena cava and has an oxygen saturation of anywhere between 60 to 75%, which makes sense if we look at the normal venous oxygen saturation of about 75% here. Via the inferior vena cava, however, we have an average oxygen saturation of about 82%. And when both of these come together, we tend to get an oxygen saturation of anywhere between 60 to 75 <coughs> percent, which is where we get the normal venous oxygen saturation of about 75. But then the question comes in, why do we get such a big difference between the oxygen saturation in the inferior vena cava and the oxygen saturation in the, in the superior vena cava? When I ask most students this, what they tend to tell me is, well, the blood's coming from the superior vena cava, that's coming from the brain, so clearly the brain uses more oxygen. Well, you're absolutely right. You know, gram for gram, the brain does use more oxygen <coughs> than the other tissues in the body. And a lot of that is because the neural tissue is so densely packed and the number of cells per gram of, for gram of mass is, is so much more dense than, for example, your pinky finger or your, you know, any part of your leg or, you know, whatever. So, as a matter of fact, your brain uses about 20% of your total oxygen consumption in one minute. So if a normal adult has an oxygen has an oxygen or has a cardiac output of about five liters, <coughs> I'm basing this on about a 70 kilogram adult. That means the brain uses one liter of that of that blood flow for its own oxygenation. So the brain uses 20% of the body's blood flow, but it only actually takes up about 2% of the body's mass. So this would explain this issue right here, except we consider that <coughs> the brain uses more oxygen, but it also gets more blood. So the actual volumetric oxygen consumption for brain tissue versus um, any other tissue in the body is about the same. So where do we get the difference? The difference comes in when we start looking at the blood coming from the inferior vena cava right here. The blood coming from the inferior vena cava is all from the lower body, which includes the liver, the kidneys, and the pancreas. <coughs> all three of these particular organs, their internal anatomy, while it's complicated, it has the same basic structure. And with the same basic structure, essentially the way it looks is you have one primary blood flow going in. This one primary blood flow will bifurcate out. When it bifurcates out, you have one of these that will go to organ perfusion. And this, this particular blood flow, the oxygen supply within it will be used, and it's just like any other normal tissue. However, the secondary blood supply, after it bifurcates out, is going to be for filtering and adding different components. So whenever we have this particular blood that's, dump, that's dumped into the venous system, its oxygen saturation is going to be about 60 to 75%.
When we have this particular blood that's dumped back in, it's going to have an oxygen saturation that's normal or 95 to 99% because nothing was used. It was just filtered. There was something added to it. And then when you take this and put it with this, it gives you an oxygen saturation averaging about 82%. So this is important to realize because in a lot of pediatric um, congenital cardiac surgeries, when we're looking at repairs, we're really looking for the biggest bang for our buck. We're not going to, we know that we're not going to be able to complete an entire repair in one surgery for a lot of these kids. So we got to say, okay, if we're going to pick a vessel, the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava to send to the lungs, which one are we going to do? Well, we're going to tend to do the superior vena cava because the oxygen saturations there are lower and they're going to give us the biggest benefit to go towards the lungs. You know, as much as it's not happy to have an oxygen saturation of 82, it's even worse to have an oxygen saturation of 60 to 75. So, <coughs> as the blood travels from the superior and inferior vena cava into the right atrium, it'll go through the tricuspid valve into the right atrium, into the right ventricle, I'm sorry, the oxygen saturation will stay about 60 to 75 percent, and then it will go out to the lungs to be oxygenated and the CO2 will be dumped off. It will then come back to the heart via the four pulmonary veins, like we said before. One, two, three, four, and into the left atrium. And we'll have an average oxygen saturation of anywhere between 95 to 99%. And this gives us the same number as right here with the SO2. But then the question comes in, why is that number not 100? Well, the if you guys remember back to, you know, the shunt equations and things like that that no one likes from respiratory school. A normal pulmonary shunt is anywhere between 1 to 5 percent of your total blood volume. <coughs> the reason you have a normal intrapulmonary shunt is because your lungs use oxygen too. They have to drain somewhere. So you have the bronchial veins, you have the thapezian veins, there's a few other sources, and they drain back into the pulmonary circulation that then is mixed with the oxygenated blood. Relatively speaking, that's a small percentage of the overall blood volume, so it's not a real big deal, but a normal intracardiac left atrial oxygen saturation is about 95 to 99%. The blood stays in the left atrium, is pumped down to the left ventricle, <coughs> and then out to the body, maintaining an oxygen saturation of about 95 to 99%. Um, I hope this helped, and I personally find that understanding where the oxygen saturations are at um, any one time, I think it's very, very important, and I think it will be a big help if you kind of begin to remember this as you look at pediatric cardiology and adult hemodynamics. Thank you very much, and I look forward to seeing you next time.